should do that. Come on. The amount of technology that you can do these days, it's kind of crazy. It's, it's good timing though. We need where it. Are you, where are you? Are you on the East Coast right now? Yeah, I'm in Brooklyn. I'm at home. See New York City out of my window. Haven't been to Manhattan for three weeks or no longer. Yeah. Are you getting a little fidgety, not traveling as much as you usually do? Yeah, definitely. This is probably the longest I've been in any one place since the womb, right? Oh, that's what it feels like. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing to keep yourself uh, occupied? Well, I um, tons of stuff to still do. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Still really busy. Get up every morning, go for a long run. That's how I start every day. Um, and then come back and I'm working really nine to five. It's, you know, back to back meetings, working on projects, trying to fix problems. Um, and then I try and have that moment in the evening, you know, the whole, as much as we love to complain about commuting, that time between place of work and place of home yeah. is if at the very least it's a transition. So it gets you out of one mood into the next. So I try, I try and do a yoga class in the evening. And then when I come out of that, I'm like, oh, you know, now it's just free time and you kind of leave the day behind you. So I'm doing pretty good. You, you were the, literally the most balanced hospitality industry person I think I've ever met. <laughs> that all boring. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's been a hard thing for me. I've, I, I've been busier than I was before during this. And it's a lot more online, like you said, back-to-back -back memes and stuff like that. But I'm yeah. stuck in my office most of the day, like eight o'clock in the morning till seven o'clock and eight o'clock at night. I'm in meetings mm. and back-to-back -back meetings all day. So I have happily admittingly put on a little bit too much weight since this whole thing happened. And so I, I need to, I've been trying to stop myself from hanging out and doing live streams at six o'clock at night and meetings at eight o'clock at night and stuff like yeah. that. It's hard to draw boundaries when we're in a completely different yeah. uh, space, right? Yeah, it's, yeah, and I, I did really well when I was in Singapore. When I was in Singapore last year, I was, I think it's mainly because I was living the single life to a degree. Like mm -hmm. I had my little hotel room and I'd go for a run in the morning. Then I come back and work out. Then I go to work, I come home, run again. Now I got my girls at home. So it's like, do I really want to go for a run after I get home? Or do I want to sit on my couch with my daughter and watch Brooklyn Nine-Nine? Yeah, you've got other priorities, that's true. So um, we're already live streaming. So I usually just roll into things like- Great. Slowly. Um, I've been doing the Post Shift podcast for almost, oh God, a year and a half now. I think I'm up to 150 something episodes. Oh, cool. So I do twice a week, but since COVID hit, I've been doing one a day, Monday to Friday, um, to sort of touch on people who- can give advice, associations that are doing stuff for restaurants and bars, um, charities. Mm. I've been talking to a lot of charities about how they're gathering funds and dispersing to the industry and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but it also gives me an opportunity to chat to people like yourself who are usually super ridiculously busy, traveling like crazy, and then actually being able to pin people down. Um, obviously, I'd love to be doing this like Tails in a in the Mons Leone or the Royal Sinesta in a, in a corner yeah. somewhere, but um zoom has changed a lot of everybody everybody's life pretty aggressively <laughs> over the last five weeks i wish i bought zoom stock before this all happened i really oh, do. yeah it would have been glorious <laughs> um but how about you kick it off and sort of uh introduce yourself and what your title is yeah so i'm charlotte boise from here in new york and i'm currently the global head of ambassador advocacy for william grant and sons that's the title <laughs> Wow. Do you do everything in the William Grants and Sons program now? Or are you still focusing on Hendrix? No, the full portfolio. So that's great. I get to work across all brands now. Wow. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. awesome. When and how did you get your start? Like, let's let's go to origin story in the industry for Charlotte Voisey. Because you've been, you've literally been a brand ambassador for as long as I've known you. Yeah, I've now been a brand ambassador more time than I've been anything else in my career. So <clears throat> I guess I'm officially no longer a bartender again. But yeah, so origin story, I guess there's kind of two chapters, right? Pre-William Grant and then post-William Grant. Um, so let's see. Uh, I guess at school, part-time job was in a restaurant. That's where I just got the taste of hospitality. Um, I probably didn't realize it then, but I just, I just loved the buzz. I loved the pace. I loved being useful. I loved working with people. I loved every day being different. 
Um, and those are probably the things that you can thread right through my career and, and anyone's really in hospitality. So when I went to university, I still really wasn't sure what I wanted to be. I didn't have that specific goal like some people do. So I decided to take a course that was quite open and vague. So I did international hospitality management. Um, and the reason I chose the course I did is because it had a mandatory year in industry and six months of that year had to be abroad. Oh, and wow. All I knew at that point is I wanted to travel and do fun things, right? So, so I did the course and the second year was a year in industry. So I found a great company called My Kind of Town, which some other OG people in the industry might have heard of. And it was six months in London, six months in Barcelona. And what I managed to get myself into was this really good restaurant management program that usually is for graduates, so post-university. The so six months in London, I learned every department of a restaurant spent time in the kitchen, um, on the floor as a waitress or a server, uh, behind the bar, host, you know, everything and, and duty management as well. So you learn all aspects of running a restaurant. And then I did that in Barcelona as well. So once I kind of graduated from their little program, usually then you go to another restaurant and, and you practice what you'd learn. I did that, only I did it in Barcelona with the added complexity of <laughs> having to do it in a language that I didn't speak. So it was one of the whole, for the first month, it was a nightmare. I literally couldn't communicate with people. And then it just clicked and I was, oh, it felt like I was fluent overnight. And then I ran a restaurant in Barcelona for about five months. But the cool thing about that was I, I had a great time. When I got back to university, you know, we all regrouped after a year and spoke about our experiences. I really quickly realized that I had not only just a great time, but I had the best learning experience of anyone other people were sort of you know caddies at a golf course or sat on the reception of a hotel for a year I actually learned how to run and manage a restaurant in two languages and met inspirational people so when I graduated I, I went straight back to that company this time I went to Argentina for two years had another great time two more years of restaurant management under my belt 9-11 hit literally um, everything changed. That was also around the time where the Argentine economic crash, well, one of them hit. So everything was devalued overnight. So it was the right time for me to come home. Uh, there weren't enough jobs in Argentina for Argentines. So I came back to London. That same company was just about to open a cocktail bar. And they asked me if I wanted to head it up. That cocktail bar was apartment 195 in Chelsea. So I opened that with the gorgeous group. It was a small team, so I was a bartender as well. Two, two years later, I got UHA Bartender of the Year, which then just opened the floodgates. Um, and one of those floodgates led to me being offered the job to join William Grant and Sons and move to America. In a nutshell, that's chapter one. That's that's a great that's a great chapter. That's, and I think I talked to um, Sven Alaming last night and. Uh, oh, yeah. And I think we all started our careers around the same time, around the same year. And so I always like to try and remind the, the youngsters that listen to my podcast or I chat to about how, not how difficult it was, but how different it was to learn anything about cocktails in that era. Like mm. there, it wasn't like I could just jump on my smartphone. If someone threw me a recipe that was like a curveball, you couldn't just jump on your smartphone. You literally had to bank everything in your head and you had to buy a book. So you want to learn about something, you buy the book. Well, and more than that, because my first bar shift was 1996, right? That whole chapter took me 10 years. Um, <laughs> we have a different legal drinking age in the UK. But it, more than that, it was for me, it was all about the people that you worked with, mm -hmm. right? It was all about your mentor. So if that person who was training you behind the bar cared and were good and knew their stuff, then you were going to be fine. Um, it was more about that than books and certainly, you know, the internet existed, but nobody really used it for that. There weren't any resources. So you would have been close to one. Were you close to one of the very first like actual brand ambassadors in the industry at that time? Because like brand ambassadors is still relatively a new term and, and role in, in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. So, that time would have been one of the first. So we opened the bar in 2000 so I was there, to, oh, sorry, 2002 to 2006, and we had ambassadors come in. I mean, the likes of Jacob Ryers, of course, uh, Claire Smith at that time with Belvedere would come in. Um, Gramania had a great brand ambassador, uh, Max Warner. There were like the first 
um, generation, if you will, ambassadors already rocking, but it was still few and far between. Um, and then I became a brand ambassador in the summer of 2006 in America. And, you know, I think it was the Simon Ford show up until then. Well, let's be <laughs> clear, it still is, right? But, um, yeah, there were very, very few of us. So um, definitely part of the sort of first guard, I guess, if you will. Yeah. What do you attribute your longevity as a brand ambassador to? Um, I think it was picking the right brand or in my case, company, right? I mean, it's kind of rule number one. If you have the luxury to really work for a brand that you truly believe in and love um, or a company that you really respect. And that was certainly true for me with Hendrix. Um, it, it always was my favorite gin. It still is. You know, I genuinely love it. Um, and then also finding the company culture that that fits, which I did with William Grant. So still being passionate about working with them and for them. And then on a more personal level, um, you know, we were joking about it before or, or commenting, but it is, it's the balance that I can strike between work and life and most importantly, my health. That's what's kept me able to do my job still, let alone want to. That's what's kept me able to still do it. Has the job changed since 2006 to now? Like, obviously, you've obviously progressed to looking up oh my goodness. the portfolio and stuff. Yeah. But how has the job changed from, like, the green days of 2006 to 2020? Yeah, it's changed so much, right? There are so many brand ambassadors now. It, it's, it became almost like this little guerrilla marketing thing that some of us did, and now it is a true industry, right? So the role itself has changed. Um, I often joke when we interview people for ambassadors, sometimes I sit through those interviews and think I would never get hired these days. <laughs> um, you know, just just the, the creativity that we demand and the level of personality and charisma that people have and display um, there's also a whole new generation, right, coming up, coming through the industry as well in our guests as as in but, um, brand ambassadors. So we also need a younger generation that can connect to them. Um, and technology too. Like I was literally a brand ambassador before Facebook, right? And that makes me feel really old. But, and the time we're living now, I know it's atypical, but I mean, it's 100% online now. And back in my day, as I like to call it, it, it really felt like it was it was the personal relationships. And just the whole thing was smaller and tight knit. I mean, you went to Vegas for, for a visit and everyone you knew in Vegas was sat around that dinner table with you that night. I mean, it was those times were so special. Um, and we won't see that again because the industry has just exploded. And it's it's what we wanted. It's what we have all been working for, right? So there's there's no complaints there. It's a beautiful thing to see. But everything was a lot more tight-knit back in those days. What does your role sort of entail now? Like, do you get to do the same things you were doing five years ago with brand educations and little guest shifts and all that sort of stuff? I, I remember one video from like 2012 Tales for the awards you were always joked about how much your travel scheduling was and you were like oh, i've got to fly to new york for a two-hour meeting then i fly back to london to to bartend the queen's birthday then i fly back to new york for four hours and then you fly somewhere else do you get to do that same sort of travel schedule and the same sort of job role you had five years ago so things have changed for me now my role has changed uh, the travel is way less intense right i I'm, it's a bad analogy but for true football fans so the one that we play in the UK. And my analogy is that I'm now a player manager, right? So I look after the team, but every once in a while, I'll throw myself on the pitch and do an event or something, right? Because uh, I still love to do that. And I still have relationships where people ask me to do those things. But the majority of my time is spent delivering through others. So mentoring, setting up the team for success, uh, recruiting, retaining the great people we have. Um, and just supporting them so that they can do their jobs the best they can. Was that a, uh, for that, because like I, I know a lot of brand ambassadors have gone from like being a great bartender, being a brand ambassador, then all of a sudden they've taken a click. I think Simon is probably a good example for this and like become managers and mentors and really learn about HR and mark in-depth marketing and PR and stuff like that. Do you do that more of a job on the training sort of thing? Or have you actually like gone on the side and done some courses and some teaching, uh, some learnings as you've gone through knowing how your role will change over the time? 
Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think, you know, the company's been really generous and kind of support the likes of me and others with like leadership coaching type courses and, and support. Um, but mostly it's just, it's on the job. I mean, I think it's fair to say that I'm one of very few people in our company now that have as much understanding about the role of an ambassador and how it can help the company and how the health company can help ambassadors. So that's what's become really rewarding for me is I feel like I really can make a difference and I know how to do this and I know how to bridge the gap now between corporate and ambassador world because they are two different worlds. Um, so I, I actually think it's just the tremendous experience that I've built up with this particular company in this industry that's been the training, if you will, rather than going off and doing some kind of, you know, MBA in leadership, which I haven't. Um, <laughs> it's it's truly about the role and the job and this company culture. And, you know, I've, I've been with the one company now for, I guess, 14 years, which is a long time. And, you know, you always wonder, is that healthy? Is it the right way to progress in one's career? Um, but it's still rewarding. And, and I have such a sort of level of not necessarily comfort, but just insight that I've, I feel like I'm really able to help people. And that's what keeps me going. So um, we had you for the BBF last week, the Bartenders but now the fund that I'm a part of last week in Toronto, um, announcing the the very generous uh, donation that uh, William Grant gave to the BBF last week. Um do you want to talk a little bit more about Standfast and how, but because was Standfast always something that was existing pre-COVID or was it something that sort of was always in part of the, the corp at CSR, the corporate social responsibility sort of thing, but now with COVID it's sort of come out much stronger. Yeah. So Standfast, the words it's, it's been the William Grant company or family motto, if you will, since 1886. Right. Um, so it's always been on our letterhead. It's always been on the, the company logo. Um, and we use it every once in a while. Like we have an internal recognition awards program, which is called the Stand Fast Awards because it just harkens back to the family. Um, but no, the Stand Fast campaign now that you refer to is our current campaign to support the on-trade in an ongoing manner throughout COVID-19. Um, so we specifically started this campaign as our response on, all right, how are we going to help bars and bartenders all over the world? Because clearly there's a lot of help that needs to be given out. So we started that campaign specifically to, um, I guess, allow people all over the, the world with William Grant to start doing things to help bars and bartenders and just to provide some kind of umbrella that we can kind of collect all of this underneath because it helps to encourage people to do more. Um, and I think it's a positive thing to be able to look at the power of the collective rather than, you know, just people doing good things all over the world. It's, it's nice for us to be able to bring it together. So we bring it together under this umbrella campaign, which we're calling Stand Fast. Um, so that would include, for example, the donation we were able to do in Canada last week. And what sort of other work are you doing all over the world when it comes to Stand Fast and other, and other agencies in the, in the world sphere? Yeah, so it's going to depend on the, each market, right? Every market or every country rather will have its own budget. It will have its own uh, set of priorities, right? I mean, the on-trade, the on-premise bars and bartenders are incredibly important to us. I think anyone that knows how we work uh, knows that and believes that. Um, but every country is going to have different priorities. You know, our overhead costs for our own people higher than they should be. Um, what are the what are the potential dangers to business that are coming into each country? So it happens on a country level decision making um, level. And then it's then also the law kicks in. Right. I mean, <laughs> The US law around liquor and the way the liquor companies and the way that we can work with bars and bartenders is, um, it, this is probably the most frustrated I've ever been with it. Um, I know that it's all there for good reason, but it, it definitely doesn't help our ability to, to aid bartenders. So we do what we can, whether it's, um, you know, buying food through restaurants who are open in some capacity, whether it's takeaway or, or delivery, um, and then directing that food to people who need it, whether that's hospitality workers or healthcare workers. Um, it's donating to established charities that are able to either give grants or do good work to help bars and bartenders. It might be donating to food banks. It might be supporting areas 
uh, like mental well-being where bartenders need to be able to pick up the phone or go have a counseling session anything we can do that's that's legal that underwrites something that a bar or a bartender needs that's the type of thing that we're doing and we're trying to do it on a grassroots as scale as we can um, so that there's a local insight right what's truly happening in this state or this country and who are the people that we need to help first and foremost that's gonna be a lot of moving part because like as a massive company like yourself getting mm-hmm. grassroots insight literally means talking to the boots on the ground the reps and the the representatives in that area about exactly what's going on yeah so for example in the us you know we were able to give a little bit of budget to everyone who works predominantly on the front line and the on-premise right because they are the people that know who needs the help so whether it's ambassadors or our on-premise sales team um, and ambassadors all over the world we have about 120 ambassadors all over the world with william grant so and that's in many different countries so they all um, have their fingers, you know, tapped into what's going on in the on a very, very local level and are able to feed back in and, and direct us and help us say, if we have X amount of money, this is where I would put it because this is who's in need. So those are the kind of decisions. Sometimes it's, it's you know, country level. If there's a big organization we can help, like the USBG in, in the US, or there's a benevolent fund in the UK, Drinks Trust, um, or, and then some of the money we've parceled out to more frontline colleagues who can get to sort of local solutions quickly. Do you think now that the, this sort of wing of the William Grant program is sort of set up now, do you feel like this may continue on after all this pandemic lockdown and everything sort of gets taken out? Do you think it's something that will become part of your CSR going forward? Uh, yes, it's looking more and more like that, right? It was set up as an ongoing effort to support the on-trade. Um, nobody knew how long that would be. You know, in early conversations, it was weeks, maybe months. And now we know that it could be a lot longer. Um, so the, the Sandfast is there for as long as the on-trade need us and for as long as we have resources to support them. So, yeah, absolutely. And even when bars and restaurants start opening again, as we well know, it's not just going to click back to how it was. Um, it's going to be a very long effort for those that are able to open and for those perhaps that don't have jobs to go back to, you know, what happens to them? So how can we support them? Uh, so, yeah, absolutely. It's enduring and it's ongoing uh, support for, for bars and bartenders. So hypothetically speaking, changing on the subject to be a little bit lighter and a little bit funner. What's your hypo- what's the, what's the some hypothetical plans you've got in place for this year for rollouts? And I see that Hendrix has sort of gone has always been a very strong brand but in the last like two years with the, the added skews and the added expressions. Mm-hmm. Um, you seem to have sort of got your, your role on. And I think it's just changed with what people are expecting from the market and from their spirits. Everybody's sort of always looking for that, that something little new, something little limited edition sort of run. What's the, the big plan even with or without COVID being involved uh, for 2020 and 2021? Yeah, we've still got some fun and innovation projects, as we call them, coming down the pipeline. I mean, you're right. Hendrix for 20 years was just Hendrix, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. And then came Orbium and then came Midsummer Solstice and then came Luna, which I haven't even seen yet, but it's out in the UK. And then came Hendrix Amazonia, which is available in airports. Not that it helps anyone at the moment because they're all closed. Um, And then we have Hendrix Absinthe, which was launched in the UK, which is phenomenal. And there are more Hendrix and innovation projects in the pipeline. Um, So those are still um, in process. Those are still planned and they they will come out, whether it's later this year or next year. Again, depending on the priorities of all of the things that we have to balance, probably next year at this point. Um, We have a new American whiskey called Fistful of Bourbon. Uh, You can follow Fistful of Terry on Instagram to see the hilarious uh, brand personality that that has. Uh, It's super fun. It's full of Terry. It's full of Terry. Uh, he'll love that shout out. Yeah, we launched in Texas last year as kind of like the pilot market and it went really well. So the plan is to launch in the US nationally this year, which we were literally about to kick off. So that's been postponed, but we're still very excited about it and we'll do it again when it's the right thing to do, when the priorities calm down. Um, so that's there. Balveni coming out with more of the stories range. Uh, Glenn Fiddick have some exciting new SKUs coming out, some new variants. So we still have a lot of sort of um, a couple new brands and some more variants of our favorite brands 
in the pipeline and that's not been cancelled or sort of shut. It's just been put on hold while we address the more immediate concerns. Um, but, yeah, we're always planning. You know, this this thing has given us many sort of challenges, but it's also given us a, some some people some time to sit and be creative. And I think often when you can't do the normal thing, you're, you're forced to obviously think outside of the box. Um, so our ambassadors have been coming up with different ideas, you know, how would they uh, communicate their brands at this time or what are they most looking forward to coming back with, that kind of thing. Do you think you're lucky with uh, or fortunate enough to work with something like William Grant where you have this sort of foundation of hundred, hundreds and hundreds of year old company mm. along with super innovation? And, and I do find like William Grant is one of those companies that always seems to have its pulse. Like you said, like the, the fistful of bourbon launching in Texas, great move, different move. Like it could have, like you're always yeah. sort of innovating and with the foundation of a 150, 200 year old company. Yeah, no, it's a really solid mix. I mean, it gives one a lot of confidence, right? Our, our Glenfiddich was first distilled on Christmas day in 1887, right? And it's still the biggest selling single malt in the world. I mean, that's a pretty impressive story to last that long. Um, and obviously the success of Hendrix and other brands. Yeah, I mean, I think the company, the family has good vision. They clearly have an eye for brands. Um, our excellence in distilling literally speaks for itself. So it's, it's really reassuring for someone like me and all of our ambassadors to be able to work on brands where we know that our liquids are really, really good. I mean, that should always come first. So that's, it allows you to go forth with confidence and have a bit of fun and be creative because you're not sort of secretly worrying about if people will sort of like the liquid, you know that it's made in the best way that it can be. So it is a really good balance. We've got this really solid foundation of, of not only proven success, but sort of, um, you know, proven attitude, I suppose, or, or a proven ethic that we come up with cool ideas, they tend to work, we make the stuff good, we keep at it, you know, we're a long-term thinking company. Um, I mean, our people love to sort of look at the numbers. And I've heard so many times that if Hendrix had been a larger supplier, what, you know, looking at its first sort of five to eight years of growth, hands down, it would have been nixed as a project just because of the, the, the slowness, mm -hmm. that's the right word, um, by which it was growing. That most sort of larger publicly traded companies would have said, no, that's not going to work. But, you know, we're still a family business, reasonably sized, um, who had the patience to say, eh, I think there's something in it. Let's, you know, keep on and, and sure enough. Um, so stories like that help, help, gives you the confidence. And and we we do love innovation, right? We want to disrupt categories, come up with cool stuff that people haven't thought of before. Um, there's just a lot of people in the company that genuinely like that and are good at it. So I think that helps us. So I don't want to take up too much of your time because I know that you are a busy lady and uh, I appreciate so much that I got a chance to sit down and chat to you because it feels like it's been a couple of years since that's happened. Um, yeah. For someone who's been in the industry as long as you have and as a brand ambassador, if someone uh, as a bartender, which most bartenders make that switch over to brand ambassador fairly sh quickly in their career, what's your big piece of advice for bartenders for longevity as well as like actually enjoying what they do and not getting caught up in the the romance of being a brand ambassador. Um, what's your biggest piece of advice for anyone wanting to get into brand ambassadorship? Yeah, I think you got to really know yourself, right? So know what brands you truly are passionate about and try and stick with them where, where you can. And then know yourself. Like you, you have to be a self-starter as an ambassador. No two days are the same. It's not like a script is given to you. Um, you can scrape by probably by just doing the minimum, but Having the brand ambassador job, in my opinion, this is what I always say to my guys, it's yours to make of it what you will. Like there's no ceiling, there's no limit. So if you're creative and driven and love what you do, you can go out there and, and you can change the face of the role. I mean, it's what certain people have done throughout the evolution of this industry. Um, but you can only do that by knowing yourself. So know what you need to be successful, whether that's sleep, diet and exercise, whether that's being around people, whether that's. Um, how much guidance, support you need. Like know yourself, know what you need to be successful and then don't be afraid to, to go get it. Well, I want to thank you for your time, Charles. It's been awesome and so good to catch up with you. Thank you so much, Sean. Thank you so much for having me. It was a real pleasure. Thank nice you. Nice to see you. <laughs> I'll see you soon.
Okay, take care. Bye. Bye.